So we're going to be asked a series of questions about a function g of x. And what is classic about this as a calculus problem is that very little information is actually given concerning the function explicitly. In fact, the only thing that they tell us explicitly is the value of the function at one particular x input. What they do give us is information about the derivative of the function and the second derivative of the function. And this lets us demonstrate the real power of calculus in reasoning about a function that we don't know explicitly. So let's just jump into this. Oh, I've also put these formulas in ahead of time because I think they may prove useful in what we're trying to accomplish. So question part A wants to know where the g has a horizontal tangent line. Let's just write that out. Where does g have a horizontal tangent? And that's really the same as asking um, for what x does g prime of x equal 0. So for that, we're going to go to the calculator, where, as you can see, I've already put into y1 g prime of x and into y2 g double prime of x. I've only highlighted the first function for now because we want to focus on that. And what we want to do is find zeros of this function. Just a word about the window that I've chosen. The interval that they've asked us to investigate is between 0.12 and 1. And so just to create a little bit of cushion, I've made our window run from 0.1 to 1.1 so that it is going to be clearer what is going on right at the boundaries of the interval in question. Similarly, because the function itself is a sine function, we know that its range is going to be from negative 1 to 1. And so, in a similar fashion, I've created a little bit of cushion by making the y min and y max negative 1.1 and 1.1. Another uh, small detail that's worth noting is that I've made the x scale increments of 0.1. That way the tick marks we have on the window are going to be more useful to us in knowing what values of x we're viewing. So let's go ahead and um, run calc 0 on this function. And we see a few potential zeros here. This may be a zero, although it's possible that it's outside of our region of interest. This is clearly going to be one of the zeros, and then here's another. So one way to determine whether this is in or out of our region of interest is to simply make our left bound equal to the start point of the interval, namely point 0.1. And then for our right bound, uh, yeah, see, you can see this blinking up here already. It tells us that this zero is outside of our interval of interest. So for our right bound, uh, point 0.2 looks like that will adequately straddle where the zero occurs, and it does. We don't provide a guess other than the right bound. We let the calculator worry about that. And so we get our first zero at point 0.1634. Let's go ahead and try to find our next zero. And here, uh, that's going to be somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4. So let's just put that in for our left and right bounds. 0.3, our right bound of 0.4. And right bound is same as guess. So we get 0.3594. That's really all we need for this problem. And so I'm just going to write evaluating numerically. This occurs at 
x equals 0 0.1634 and x equals 0 0.3594. On to part B. Part B wants to know where over that same interval is one or more inter or zero or more intervals of G being concave down. Now G concave down, we have to remember immediately that that is the same. as g double prime less than zero. So what we want to find are the edges of this interval, namely the zeros of g double prime, and then confirm uh, that it is below the x-axis. Let's go back to our calculator. And we need to change the formula that we have turned on. We'll turn off the y1 equation or formula. And we'll, oh, I didn't quite get that. Let's turn off y1 and turn on y2. So let's do a second trace. 0. Let's see what we get. Okay. Those are zeros. It's a little difficult to understand whether this is a negative region or a positive region because these lines go up so straight. Um, looks like this is a negative region and this is a positive region. And this is crossing right at 1 it looks like. The question is, is it exactly at 1? Because that's the edge of our interval. Well, if you look briefly at the function itself, that g double prime, I think what you'll see is that it is precisely at 1 that this term goes to 0. And prior to that, it's positive. So we can rule this out as an area of interest because it's right at the edge of the boundary. So it really comes down to these two. And why don't we just change the window just to be a little more comfortable that we're really looking at a concave down region, meaning a region where the second derivative is negative. So let's. Let's change our resolution so that we go from negative 10 to 10. That should make things clearer. OK. Yeah, this is, this is clearly a region of negative. So the question is, how do we find these endpoints? And so well, let's let that graph finish. but. When it asks us for the left bound, we'll just put in 0.12, right at the left edge of the interval in question. And then 0.2 looks like it will work for the right bound. So our left bound is 0.12. Our right bound, we're going to have 0.2. And our guess is the same as our right bound. So we get that 0 at 0.1294, just barely into the region of interest. Let's do a second calculation for the next 0. And we'll put that, uh, let's make our left and right bounds 0.2 and 0.3. Those clearly straddle the place where the 0 occurs. And our guess the same as our right bound. OK, so we get 0.2227. We could answer the question now. And I'm just going to say evaluating numerically.
this occurs on the interval uh, what do we have 0 0.1294 and 0 0.2227. Part C, we need an equation for the line tangent to the g function at x equals 0 0.3. And I find this probably the most interesting uh, part of the question. Well, an equation of a line tangent, it's um, very convenient to use point-slope form, and that's why I've written it up there to remind us what point-slope form is. So let's just duplicate that, filling in the values that we need to identify. We have y minus, well, y1 is the height of g at 0 0.3, okay, equals m, well that's the slope of g at 0 0.3, the derivative evaluated at 0 0.3, and then x minus x1 is of course 0 0.3. So it really falls to us to figure out these two unknowns, g at 0 0.3 and g prime at 0 0.3, both of which we can handle with the calculator. The easier one of these two is g prime 0 0.3. Let's just go back to our function, change back to go went too far. Turn this on. Turn this off. And what we want to know is where is this equal to 0 0.3? So we, we want a table. And our table is set to start at 0 and move in increments of 0.1. So that will work just fine for our needs because 0.3 will come up. And so we see that the slope at 0.3 is negative 0.4722. Okay. Now, how are we going to find the... Let's just write that in before we lose it. Um, so we have negative 0 0.4722. How are we going to find this? Okay, Here we have to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. And um, colloquially, it fits this situation uh, sort of like this. We're given the height of the function in question at one point, but we need to find it at some other point. And so the height at any given point is the height at the known point plus the indefinite integral of the derivative of your function from the known point to the point that you're trying to find the height for. So let's go ahead and work with that. What we need is The height in question we have over here, g of 1 is 2, so we'll put that in. Plus, now we need to do an indefinite integral uh, jump to the f's, scroll down. F and I and T, and input our values. Our start point is where we know the height, 1. Our end point is where we want to know the height, 0.3. We work with the derivative of the function, whose height they want us to find, and we characterize that function in terms of x. So that's what needs to go here. 
get 1.5460. So, again, what we did to calculate g of 0.3, let me just write that out explicitly. What we said was, borrowing from this formula, we said g of 0.3 equals g at the point that I know plus the indefinite integral from the point I know to the point I want of the derivative of the function in question. And the value that we got there was uh, 1.5460. So now we are in a position to finish this off. We can say that the equation of the tangent line is y minus 1.5460 equals negative 0 0.4722 times x minus 0 0.3. And we can just leave it in this point slope form. There's no need to take the time and risk the mistake of converting it to y equals mx plus b form. All right, finally part d asks whether the tangent line, this one that we've just computed, lies above or below the graph. And again, it's uh, if you don't understand calculus, it's a curious question because <clears throat> we don't actually know what the graph of that function looks like. But here's the key. <clears throat> We're working in an interval that goes from 0.3 over to 1. And in part b, we've already determined that the concave uh, down interval is, it, is from 0.12 to about 0.22. And we saw similarly that it was concave up for the rest of that interval. Namely, from this point up to 1, it's concave up. That means that the graph of G must look something like this. We know that it had a, a negative slope at 0.3, but we know that the slope was becoming increasingly positive because of what they told us about the curvature. And therefore, the tangent line that we constructed right at 0.3 it continues past 0.3, going down at the same slope all the way till the end of the interval 1, whereas the function itself takes on increasingly less negative values. That's what the concave up versus concave down teaches us. And so now we know the answer to the question. Um, and let's see, because, let's write it like this, because g of x is concave down, or I'm sorry, is concave up over the interval, over the entire, just to emphasize, interval in question, the tangent line lies below g of 